welcome to the lecture for research methods. Uh, I'll be talking about non-experimental research designs, in particular descriptive research, uh, correlational research, and a subset of correlational research, in particular causal comparative studies. Starting off a little bit about uh, descriptive research, the overall goal when doing uh, this type of research is to summarize data when there's just a whole lot of information out there and you want to make sense of it to say, well, what do we know uh, about something? Right. You're, not necessarily, you're not yet looking at uh, relationships between variables or cause and effect. It's just kind of what do we know? So when do you want to know that kind of things? Well, uh, sometimes when you want to identify uh, the limits of a phenomenon, especially if it's a, a, a new uh, phenomenon, and you want to know, well, how much is this going on? Uh, so something like uh, social media use, which is still fairly new. Uh, how many people are, are doing it? How much are they doing it? Um, in what ways are they engaging uh, in interactions via uh, social media platforms? Uh, or what's that, the uh, bath salts, people using those things to get high. How, how prevalent is that? Right? So getting just some, some hard data on, on phenomenon sometimes is an important first step in research. Right? Um, and from a research point of view, it's often good, well, how, how many people are doing it to then figure out, uh, helps the beginning stages of planning other research in terms of why people are doing things, what, what are the causes of doing these things. Uh, but also from a, um, a policy standpoint, oftentimes uh, government agencies uh, are interested in uh, doing descriptive research to find out um, you know, how many people are experiencing certain problems uh, in order to figure out how, m how much resources are needed, right? So if you say a descriptive research study might be conducted or might have been at one point in time to identify how many people were displaced by a natural disaster like uh, Hurricane Katrina. Because right? we know how many people are there before we can figure out you know, how much money we need to set aside, um, what kind of, you know, how mu in the immediate, immediate term, how much water, how much food, all that stuff. Well, it's good to ha have real numbers to work with rather than uh, guessing or just saying, well, we'll get as much as we can and hope that's enough. Right? Uh, so being more empirical about it uh, is often uh, helpful. Uh, and as I've already kind of alluded to, discrete, discrete research is often um, simply a starting point before launching into uh, um, sometimes more interesting research in terms of why certain things uh, are occurring, trying to figure out cause-effect relationships. Um, we're trying to predict who does certain things. First, we need to say, figure out, does anybody do this thing? Right? Uh, and who are these, uh, these people uh, in general? So getting an idea of that often uh, leads to hypotheses um, in or in, uh, that could be used or examined in a correlational study or even an experimental study. And the, the last one, which I've also touched on a little bit already, is uh, establishing the relevance or importance of a problem. Right? Like if you say, well, I really, really want to do research on um, uh, why uh, um, kids um, are engaging in uh, um, intercourse earlier than they used to. Right? Well, before you can do that, you've got to establish that that's actually happening, right? And that it's, you know, uh, a real thing and not just, you know, because you maybe you know a couple people, well, I knew this uh, one family and they had a 12 year old and they were uh, already pregnant. And gee, this is a real problem with everybody. Well, you know, one or two people you know isn't everybody. So you gather data to find out how big of a problem is it, how relevant is it, is it important to then find out why this is happening um, from a kind of uh, larger scale. Uh, the data analyses that you would use in research, primarily uh, looking at things like your measures of central tendency, right? Mean, which is your average uh, number uh, of something, median being the middle number, and mode, the most occurring uh, number, um, and then also measures of variability like standard deviation, right? Which is just uh, uh, assuming data are normally distributed, it, gives, it can give us an idea of, um <coughs> excuse me. Uh, percentages of people uh, that uh, um, experience certain things, like we figure out, well, uh, the average uh, number of uh, traffic accidents that um, somebody will encounter by the time they're 50 is 2.3 with a standard deviation of 0.28. Right? Well, if, if those data are normally distributed, 
because of what we know about the normal curve, we can say, well, plus or minus one standard deviation. So uh, there's, you know, 68% of the people will fall in that range. So uh, plus or minus that uh, 0.28 standard deviation from your mean, that's about how many, um, you know, most people will have somewhere in that neighborhood of accidents. Right, so it gives you uh, some idea of some idea of prediction just from descriptive stuff, uh, and then range obviously is uh, from the, the smallest amount to the largest amount, which can be important information. But the often the more interesting research is then at the next something like correlational research. Right. And here the goal is to go beyond uh, describing and summarizing data or behavior, but then to go ahead and look at uh, the relationship between variables. So you're you're essentially measuring the size, how, how and in terms of strong relationship down to weak relationship. Uh, well, strong, moderate, weak down to no relationship. Which two things are unrelated. You know, and the direction of the relationship between variables, uh, to two variables or among variables. You can actually there are some correlational methods you can use to look at relationships among more than two variables uh, simultaneously. So you're looking at things often in a kind of uh, a linear sense in terms of, okay, if um, we're looking at one variable, if it increases in value, going from one person to the next, um, if there's a positive relationship between two variables, and if one variable increases, going from one person to the next, then the other variable should also increase, right? They're going to co-vary in the same direction. The thing, if you go from one person to the next, think it's smaller, a positive would also mean that on the other variable, it would also get smaller. So they're going in the same direction. And a negative relationship, you know, the opposite direction, means the opposite. So going from uh, one person to the next, uh, one variable gets bigger. That means in the other variable, from person to the next, it should get smaller in value. Or getting smaller leads to getting bigger. Right. Um, the uses of correlation research uh, varied. Um, one of the main ones, though, is, is uh, prediction. Whenever um, we want to be able to measure one variable and have some uh, knowledge of another variable without having to measure it. So we do the study measuring both things at once, see if there's a relationship. And if so, then we can go out and measure one thing in people to know the likelihood of the other thing happening. Let's get an idea, right? It's often helpful in identifying things like risk factors and protective factors. Right? Um, so if we know that um, there's a correlation between number of uh, cigarettes you smoke and um, likelihood of uh, getting cancer, the number of people, uh, people that smoke more, more likely to get cancer, then we can identify that smoking is a risk factor for cancer. Which, you know, at, at that point of doing a correlational study, uh, if you did the first correlational study on this, it w you wouldn't be able to say, well, it's clearly a causal relationship. Right? We don't know that smoking causes it. Even if it doesn't cause it, it can be helpful information in terms of being a risk factor. In terms of, okay, well, this person, uh, they're smoking a lot. We, we know they're at high risk. So even if the smoking doesn't cause it, if we have anything we can do to uh, uh, ameliorate the risk, to make it less likely to get cancer, you know, increase the number of antioxidants you uh, consume, then we're going to give people who have smoke a lot lots of antioxidants. Um, same thing with protective factors. So having this one thing means that you're less likely to have a problem. Well, it doesn't mean that having that one thing is good for you and keeps you from having the problem, but it's somehow associated, and so it helps us know, okay, well, maybe you don't need as many resources because you have these protective factors, so you don't need these programs for at-risk students. Right? Um, and we often see that in terms of um, uh, certain variables that, uh, you know, it doesn't make sense in terms of a causal relationship where, um, you know, where socioeconomic status might put kids at risk uh, for certain things. And it's not that, you know, having a, a low-income family um, causes you to have certain negative outcomes. Like that's not why these things happen. There's lots of other complicated reasons, but we know it's a risk factor. Right? And so uh, sometimes uh, you'll have programs for people from lower SES uh, um, uh, communities uh, provide with more resources because we know they're at risk for these other negative things happening. Right? And we know that from correlational research, not because we did stuff to them to then make some bad thing happen, just because we looked at existing data and found a, a relationship. Um, so uh, correlation often helpful in prediction. 
because of we know about the, again the direction of relationships. So as one thing goes up, the other goes up or goes down, or if there's no relationship, that's also important to know. Like we find that you know there's because uh, even though we say you know you can't in infer causation from correlation, uh, and we'll talk more about that later. But if uh, there is a causal relationship truly between two variables, they will be correlated. Right. So if we find uh, no correlation pretty unlikely that it, there's a causative thing going on, right? So if there's if there's no correlation between the amount of red meat you eat and, and heart disease, then unlikely that eating red meat causes heart disease. I'm not saying that that's true. I don't know the data on that, but it's just uh, an example. Uh, another uh, use, if you're interested in multiple levels of a variable, cause sometimes people think about, well, if I want to do, if I'm really interested in causation, I'll just do experimental uh, study. So I'll have two groups, you know, I'll have them, you know, uh, Yes, the variable, the variable, independent variable is there. No, it's not. And are they different on dependent variable? And often that's uh, important information. But even think about things where you could easily manipulate independent variable, uh, like a, a drug uh, or um, uh, alcohol, whatever, some active psychoactive substance. Um, if you do an experiment and you have two groups, then you have the presence of it, the absence of it. Is there a difference? And that may be important. But what if you want to know at what point does taking this drug lead to uh, you know a better outcome or a worse outcome? Right? What's the break point? Right? If you do it in kind of an experimental way where you had groups, you have to have multiple groups. So talking about some drug, you know, we, okay, we have a five milligram group, a ten milligram, fifteen, a twenty, a twenty-five, a thirty, you know, all this way. Whereas if people are naturally taking uh, different amounts, so of uh, whatever drug, uh, some taking five, some six, seven, eight, nine, all the way up there where it's continuously distributed, the amount of the drug that they're naturally consuming, if we look at uh, the correlation between whatever they're consuming and whatever our outcome variable is, then we can look at multiple levels of the variable. We might be able to see some sort of pattern where um, you know, there's a uh, positive relationship up until this point, and then it becomes negative, or then it flatlines, uh, whatever. Correlational research can help you uh, figure that out. Um, uh, more efficiently than if you're dividing people into groups and making them take certain levels. You're looking at all the levels rather than uh, specified levels, if that makes sense. Um, and again, um, even though you can't uh, directly infer causation from correlation, but correlation means it may be causation. And if you're interested in is there a causal relationship between uh, variables, but you can't manipulate the independent variable, and correlation research is where you're going to go, right? So let's stop and think about why couldn't you manipulate an independent variable? Well, sometimes because it's already happened, right? So if we want to look at, well, what's the relationship between um, uh, whether or not you were born uh, in the uh, before the Depression and uh, how often you go behind people turning off lights? We can't assign you to be before the be born before the depression or after the depression. Right? We can't manipulate that that variable. It's already happened. Uh, other things, uh, there may be ethical or practical concerns that prevent us from uh, manipulating independent variable. We want to look at well, um, what are the uh, effects of uh, uh, losing a spouse on uh, mood or on uh, cognition or whatever on any dependent variable? You can't kill somebody's spouse not practical and very not ethical. Right? That's just wrong. Um, so you have to kind of look at existing data where you can't manipulate the new variable. Like you think maybe there's a causal relationship. Well, I think losing spouse would cause you to think differently this way or feel differently this way. But I can't assign people to uh, levels of new variable. Therefore, I can't do true uh, experimental research, but I can maybe look at, uh, look at it in a correlational way where I have kind of existing data. And is there some relationship between uh, uh, known things? Um, and then uh, the fourth one, uh, if you want to uh, have kind of a naturalistic design, where because um, again, in experimental studies, uh, you're going to have lots of experimental control. You're, you're going to be maybe in a lab setting, but maybe you want to well, I want to know what's the relationship between these variables in the real world. And if you want to look at things in the real world you're probably not going to be able to do an experiment because you can't manipulate people in the real world. It's no longer real world. You're toying with things, right? So if you want to see them as they're happening, as they are, you're probably going to be looking at it in a correlational way. Primarily correlational means not manipulating the infinite variable. Okay. Um, 
Okay, a couple terms to be sure you're uh, familiar with. Uh, predictor variable and criterion variable. Right? When we talk about experimental designs, we talk about an independent variable and a dependent variable. When we talk about correlation research, we don't use those terms. Instead, we use predictor and criterion, where the predictor variable is what you're predicting with, and the criterion variable is what you're predicting to. Um, so if you say, well, uh, and if, you, if you're thinking uh, cause and effecty, right? Uh, then the predictor variable is like an independent variable and the criterion is like the dependent variable in terms of if I think if I want to know I think uh, uh, that smoking causes cancer if I could experiment and make people smoke then smoking would be my independent variable and getting cancer would be the dependent variable right? but I can't do that I can't assign people to do those things so I can't do experiment um, so uh, smoking level would be the predictor variable and getting cancer would be the criterion because I'm trying to predict the cancer. So you're always trying to predict the criterion with the predictor. Okay, so that makes sense. Uh, and whenever you're thinking kind of cause effect uh, terms, uh, it, it it's clear, makes sense which ones which. It's not always clear if you're not if you really don't think there is a cause effect. You're just looking at potential relationship between variables. Uh, you think there's an association to between two things then it's some, somewhat arbitrary which one's the predictor, which one's the criterion. Like if you're looking at the relationship between depression and anxiety, right? is it that people um, uh, are anxious and then being anxious long enough makes you depressed, or is it that people that get depressed, and if you get depressed long enough, then you become anxious? Right? If you're not sure which way that causal error, error, error goes, you may arbitrarily assign one variable to be the predictor and the other to be uh, the criterion. Okay. In terms of data analyses, when we're looking at bivariate correlations, so relationships between uh, uh, two variables, most of these uh, um, uh, are looking at uh, looking for a linear pattern between two variables. So. Uh, we have here kind of a, a scatter plot where you have a bunch of data points and then they've kind of drawn in the best fitting line. Right? And the best fitting line is the one where uh, if you take every data point and calculate its distance from the line, some are above, some are below. So think, think of the dots above the line having a, a positive distance from it and the ones below the line having a negative distance from it. The best line is the one where the positives and the negatives cancel out to as close to zero as possible, where you have the least different, least amount of difference of every spot on average from the line. Right. Uh, and the more that the pattern of dots looks like a line, the more likely it is you have a statistically significant correlation that there is a, a linear trend there, right? such that in this case, a positive correlation going from uh, left to right on the x-axis, on the bottom axis, uh, corresponds to increases bottom to top on the y-axis. If it were uh, a negative correlation, that line would be pointing the other way. For those of you geometry nerds, it would have a negative slope. Um, okay, so bivariate correlations are typically used with continuous variables. There are some special uh, correlational coefficients you can calculate for uh, non-continuous variables, but most of the ones that you'll probably be worried about or for uh, continuous variables instead of uh, you know categorical, so that um, there every possible value uh, of a number is uh, uh, could be obtained in in your data set. Right. Um, so you know uh, uh, amount of water somebody pours into a cup it can be zero, can be point zero 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 one, can be point zero 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 two, can be three, can be four, can be whatever, uh, between, at least between, and there's some a maximum amount that'll fit in the cup, obviously, between those two points, an infinite number of gradations, depending on how, how specifically you could, you could measure something, it's possible to get different amounts. Uh, for those types of data, we use bivariate correlations. The most common one to use would be the Pearson R. So that the Pearson R is the correlation coefficient. Uh, the value ranges from negative one to positive one. And when you write a positive correlation, you don't put the plus sign here. I just put it here for, for emphasis. Um, but just a one would be a positive one. Uh, and both of those, a negative one and a positive one, are both perfect correlations. And a perfect correlation, thinking back to that diagram we just saw, would be every dot is on the line. So the more the dots get away from the best fitting line, the more blobby it becomes. 
the smaller the correlation gets, and smaller in terms of absolute value. So they're closer to zero. Coming in from positive one on the right and negative one on the left, coming in towards zero, you're getting a weaker correlation. You're getting a, a blobbier pattern where it's more diffuse. And well, they're it's not that clear that they're related to where once you get kind of a big you know circle, they're not related at all. Right? Increases on one doesn't tell you anything about the other. Increase from one person to the uh, next, depending on who you're looking at, some people go up, some people go down. Right? Versus, oh, they typically go up, or they typically go down. Um, so that gives you an idea, uh, the, the absolute size of the correlation gives you an idea of the strength, with one being the strongest, perfect, which you never see, zero being absolutely no correlation. Um, and again, the, the sign, uh, the positive negative merely indicates direction, has no bearing on magnitude. So a negative 0.2 is the same size as a positive 0.2. Um, and then the other cool thing about uh, correlational coefficients is if you square them, you get something called the coefficient of determination, which the coefficient of determination tells you the amount of variability in one variable that can be accounted for or explained by variability in the other variable. So the amount of variability in one variable that can be accounted for or explained by variability in the other variable. Uh, and it's represented in a, a percentage. Right? So uh, if you have a correlation of one, then it's 100%. So changes in one variable completely explain or account for changes in the other. Which explain means, well, um, it's uh, completely consistent where we, we, we could know exactly how much, if we know how much you change on this variable, we'll, we'll, we know exactly how much you would be expected to change on the other variable. Right? Whereas if you look at a correlation of uh, r equals 0.8 or r equals negative 0.8, uh, square that, and, and 0.8 seems pretty high, right? That's not that far from 1. Uh, but square that, and we're down to 64%, down from 100%. So uh, going up on one variable, if it's a r, r equals 0.8, it um, means we're probably going to go up on the other variable, too. You know, uh, with kind of 64% confidence, 60% of the time, this idea of yep, still a lot of the variability we can explain. There's some variability, so some people won't go up the amount we would exactly expect. Right? Some people may even go down a little, but not very often. Most times, it's going to hold true in terms of the direction of the relationship and the amount that we expect. Um, based on the variability in the, in the data sets. Um, but uh, um, hopefully you, you, you can pick up on with uh, the math here that uh, changes in R and changes in R squared are a little different, right? We go from um, one R, uh, R of 1 to R of 0.9. That's a difference of, you know, you know 10%, right, of, of uh, 0.1. But if we look at the coefficient of determination, we go from 100% down to 81%, almost a 20% drop. So even looking at something like um, an R of uh, 0.7 to uh, 0.5. So 0.7 is 49%, 0.5 is 25%. So a drop from 0.7 to 0.5, and we've got half as much variability being explained. Um, and so you might think, well, okay, well then I guess we should always want to have correlations of around 0.7 at least, you know, half of the variability or higher. And that would be nice, but depending on what kind of uh, data you're looking at, you're not going to see that too often. Um, if you're looking at two things that uh, are very, very similar and should be highly correlated, then yeah, you, you might get R of uh, 0.8. Like if you're doing, uh, giving the same exact measure to people, you know, uh, one week apart on something that they shouldn't train on, shouldn't change on, uh, like uh, uh, state anxiety, like not how anxious do you, sorry, trait anxiety, not how anxious are you right now, but generally how anxious are you? They fail the test today, they fail the test uh, a week later, we get bigger people to do that, and we compare the scores time one to time two. The reliability, uh, or the correlation between time one and time two should be pretty high, should be, you know, 0 0.9, 0 0.8 if it's a good test, because uh, it's the same exact questions and it's something that shouldn't have changed. And you may think, well, yeah, it should be exactly one then, right? Well, it sh maybe it should be, but it won't be. People will answer slightly differently. You know, one question here, one question there, a little differently. 
And so you, even with things that you're measuring the exact same thing, you don't get a perfect correlation. So then when we're measuring things that um, are related, but not full overlap related, we're going to get smaller correlations. Things like maybe 0 0.5, 0 0.4, even 0 0.3. We still get excited about finding a correlation of 0.3 uh, in a study. You say, well, geez, if I can only get that 0.3. That's only 9% of the variability. Well, that's, that's useless. Not necessarily, right? If we're looking at uh, predicting something like um, um, academic success, and if we measure uh, academic success by uh, uh, GPA, looking at elementary school, right? and um, we find there's a correlation between the amount of time parents spend uh, working on homework with their kids and academic success, GPA. We find that correlation to be 0.3. Like, oh, geez, only this has 9% of the variance. It must not play that big a role. Not necessarily. It means there's a lot of other things playing a role, too, which makes sense. I mean, kid, whether or not kids are going to do well in school is going to be related to their innate uh, cognitive ability. That's going to be related to um, the fit with the teachers and related to what kind of classroom they're in in terms of their peers. Um, it's going to be related to their diet. That's, you know, all these different things that go in that regardless of how much, you know, you read to your kid and do homework with them, you can only make them go so high or so low. doesn't mean that uh, it's not important to, you know, read your kids and do homework with them. And that doesn't have a beneficial uh, influence. Right? It just means that there's a lot of other things involved. And that's how most things that we study in psychology are. Most things are multiply influenced. Right? Where we're not going to find, oh, this one thing. If you do this one thing, everything's going to be fine. Do this one thing and you won't be depressed. Do this one thing and your relationship will be fine. No. And if we find just one little thing, well, doing this thing will account for this, this much variability, then that's, that's good. And then we start finding more and more things, if we can string all those together, which we'll, when we talked about regression a little bit, we'll find that if you add more uh, predictors to a model, and like multiple regression, we start adding uh, uh, variability, then we can explain a lot more. So if we, know, if we know a lot more about you, we can predict some criterion more accurately, which should just make sense. But the overall point here is uh, don't expect correlations to be close to one, uh, and, and don't, get, uh, don't be too critical of uh, small correlations, like small being you know, 0.3. Once you get down to 0 0.2, 0 0.1, uh, and they're still statistically significant, may not be that important, which we'll come back and talk about uh, in a minute. Okay, so that's our traditional correlation is usually looking at multiple uh, at uh, bivariate correlations. Uh, but sometimes you want to look at multiple predictors, multiple predictors with one criterion variable. Right, this is what I was talking about. About instead of just saying, okay, is this is A related to B? Say, well, how can we predict uh, um, uh, D given what we know about A, B, and C? I have multiple predictors trying to use those together to predict some criterion, and that's what multiple regression is for. Right. So it's not just correlating uh, A with D, B with D, C with D. It's looking at how do A, B, and C together combine to predict D. Right. And depending on how you do it, generally what it does is says, well, which of these variables, which of these predictors is most strongly related? And then that kind of goes into the equation first. Right. And then it eats up some variability. Right. So if there's a correlation of 0.3, it eats up 9% of the variability. There's still a lot of variability left in the criterion, right? 81% left. That hasn't been explained, unexplained, unaccounted for variability. Then you put in another uh, variable, and you find out, well, how much does it explain of what's left over, right? So when you put in uh, uh, variable B, maybe it has got a correlation of uh, 0.3, uh, with C also, but let's say it had a question of 0.3 B with uh, D, sorry, uh, independently if it is just a bivariate correlation. Well, if we put it in a regression and A's already eaten up some of the variability, well, it may have eaten up some of B's variability. They may have, had, they may have been shared variants that they explained. So when it goes into a regression, if A's already eaten some of its variability, it may only have a correlation of 0.2 instead of 0.3 because it, you're looking at unique variability explained. Now, what's explained by this variable after this other thing, above and beyond this other thing? Right? And that's where, ins really, instead of uh, correlation coefficients, multiple regression gives us beta weights. And beta weights are basically like Pearson R's, 
conceptually, uh, where you know when you run a multiple regression, you get some big uh, uh, R squared value, and is it significant or not? Um, and it often looks very much like uh, a nova, may get an F value, but then you look for each predictive variable, you get a, a beta weight, right, which tell you how much variability, uh, how strongly is this variable related to the criterion. And the first one gets to eat, eat first, and the second one, what's left over, and then the third one. Um, which uh, can be very helpful in terms of if you've got a lot of things, you're saying, well, which, you know, we can only uh, uh, spend money on uh, improving one of these things. Which one is most strongly associated with this outcome? Because we're going to fund w targeting that, uh, that problem. Right? And so you can put in a, a, all these variables into a regression, and one of them is going to win in terms of, hey, I, I have the most unique variance explained. Just dealing with me will uh, will solve, will do the most good, right? Or maybe the the first two. Okay, well these two together account for 60% uh, of the variance, and adding these other variables only adds only counts for another two or three percent. Right? They may still be important, but they don't add beyond what we've already done. Right? So you can figure that kind of stuff out with multiple regression, which is uh, pretty cool. Um, okay. Uh, another thing you might want to do is look at the relation between two categorical variables. Right? Cause we said before, typically with correlations and even multiple regression, we're looking at continuous variables. And there are some tricks you can do with regression and even bivariate correlations where you have uh, um, some sort of categorical variables, like uh, what they call dummy coding variables, where uh, uh, like uh, finding the correlation between gender and something. We're going to code it as a zero and a one for female and male or male and female. Not going to get into that now. Easier to to use this other approach, just treat categorical variables as true categorical variables, uh, where there's not a continuum, but you're either this or this, right? You're either male or female, which uh, I guess that's sort of actually a bad example because there are actually degrees of maleness and degrees of femaleness. Um, but you know, you drive a red car or you drive a, a blue car, that kind of thing. Uh, and if you have variables like that, you may use something like a chi-square um, test of independence, right? Not the chi, there are two different chi-squares. Um, not the goodness of fit chi-square, but the chi-square um, test of uh, independence. So um, let's say you're interested in, uh, you know, is the preference person's uh, preference for type of soda, their favorite soda, related to their favorite TV show? And again, you think here, well, why would that be? Well, if there's product placement going on in these TV shows where they're showing Coca-Cola or Pepsi or Mountain Dew or uh, whatever, you may think there's a relationship such that, okay, and it could be that, oh, people that uh, uh, drink this thing then like this show because they are somehow identifying with it, or it could be that uh, seeing it in the show, your favorite show, makes you want to buy the drink, whatever, you know, so that the causation could run either way, but here again you're looking at it in a correlational sense, you just want to know is there a relationship, and you could run a chi-square test of independence to, to look at that. Um, uh, which uh, is can help you answer some interesting questions, not the uh, most rigorous uh, test. If you have a, a lot of data, it's easy to get a statistically significant chi-square. So some people frown on it, but uh, it does have its place, does have its use. Um, and the interpretation is pretty straightforward in terms of it's yes significant, no not significant, and then you look at, okay, uh, what percentage of people, you know, that like the show also uh, um, liked a certain uh, product, or what percentage of people liked a certain product liked the show, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and the last one I want to talk about in terms of uh, um, types of correlation research that use different data analysis uh, uh, approaches uh, is causal comparative research. Right? So this is a, a type of correlation research that tries to be more experimental. Right? It's not quasi-experimental research, which we'll talk about later, and it's not experimental research, but it, it, it wants to be more experimental, more cause and effecty than kind of traditional uh, correlational methods. Uh, your book refers to it as expo facto research. Right? Uh, this is when you have two existing groups and you want to see if they're different. 
and the assumption here is that the difference is because of, it's the result of, their group membership. Right? So you're looking at something that's already happened, uh, something that these groups uh, did, or some characteristic of the people in the group, something about them. Um, you know, so thinking, oh well, um, uh, being a football fan uh, uh, makes you uh, buy more beer. Right? So football fans will, will buy more beer than um, uh, can't think of other fans, uh, tennis fans, and thinking there's some sort of causal relationship there. So you wouldn't go out and try to make people football fans or tennis fans. You wouldn't make them buy beer and see what support they like. They're existing groups, and they've already exhibited some behavior. They've, they've bought beer or not bought beer. So then you're just going to be surveying them, right? Um, okay, what's your favorite sport in the past week? How many uh, cases of beer have you bought? And your the assumption there is that there's some sort of causal mechanism uh, going on. Uh, and so here, typically we have groups, right? So one of the variables, because it's group, is categorical. So it's kind of wanting to be uh, an independent variable, but it's really not. So it's somewhere between a quasi-independent variable and a predictor variable. And then the other variable is typically continuous, right? Number of beers. Um, if we did, uh, did you buy a beer, yes or no? Well, that's a categorical variable, and then we're going to use a chi-square test of independence. But typically with causal comparative, the dependent variable uh, or criterion variable is uh, continuous. And so when we have one categorical and one continuous variable, we use something like a t-test or an ANOVA. Right? A t-test when you're comparing two groups on one continuous variable. Uh, ANOVA when you're comparing um, more than two groups. So if you have football fans versus basketball fans versus tennis fans, all on number of beers they bought. Okay. In terms of interpreting uh, correlational research, um, sometimes people want to uh, infer causation from correlation, and you can't do it uh, directly. Right? But correlation might be evidence of causation. It's it's somewhat questionable, uh, worrisome evidence for two main reasons. One, the directionality problem. Right? W if there's a correlation between A and B, we don't know if A cause B or B cause A. Right? So we know there's a correlation between the amount of time spent in the sun and mood, positive mood, positive correlation between mood uh, and uh, sun exposure. And is it the fact that uh, sun exposure causes increased mood, and that's why those two, two things co vary positively? Or is it that people who are in a better mood go outside more and therefore get more exposed to the sun and people who are in a uh, lower mood stay inside more and get less sun exposure right which one comes first chicken or the egg so uh, that can be a problem so if you want to establish or if you want to kind of uh, buttress your evidence for uh, uh, causation from a course of study you have to establish uh, what the kind of the temporal relationship is the, the time association here right if it, if you can clearly establish that one thing preceded the other, right? Even if you didn't manipulate it, that's stronger evidence for causation. It's still not as strong as if you'd done an experiment and you had made people, you know, go in the sun, not go in the sun. But if you can establish that one thing preceded the other, then you've got uh, more evidence of, uh, of causation. Uh, the other big one is the third variable problem, right? Uh, and this is where relationship between A and B. Uh, uh, a doesn't cause B and B doesn't cause A, but there's some third variable that um, explains that relationship. Like if, we, like if I said that uh, um, you know, there's a positive correlation between the number of ashtrays in your house and likelihood of having cancer, ashtrays don't cause cancer. Cancer doesn't cause you to have ashtrays. Right? There's a third variable. People who smoke have more ashtrays, and people who smoke have more cancer. Right? So this third variable explains the relationship between two other variables. Um, so uh, you have to, if you again want to uh, increase your credibility in terms of causation, you have to account for the, this 
uh, potential third variable or third variables, right? Alternative explanations for why these things are related. Okay, yeah, there's a relationship, but it's because of this. Right? Well, you got to think of, uh, got to account for those arguments. And one way to do it in correlation search is to measure those other variables, right? Um, this is uh, really important for uh, causal comparative research, you know, where you have these two groups. Right. And I'm going to show that they're different on the uh, dependent variable. You say, well, yeah, those two groups are also, also different on this third variable, which explains why they're different on the thing you're looking at. Well, measure that third variable and see if they really are different. And if they are, well, you've got a problem. If they're not, then you've accounted for that. You said, oh, well, no, they actually are the same on that variable. So that third variable is not an issue. So you measure potential, potential third variables. You try to anticipate, okay, what would people say why else would I find a positive or, or a negative, a significant correlation between the variables I'm interested in? People might say, oh, well, it's because of this. Okay, I'm going to measure that and see if it's true, see if it plays a role. Uh, the other thing you can do sometimes is a matched group design. And this is more for uh, causal comparative than other forms of correlational research. Um, uh, so when selecting your sample, you create uh, groups that are similar on important variables, right? So if you have your uh, tennis group and your football group, so if you've got a pool of a lot of tennis fans, a lot of football fans, and people say, oh, you're looking at you know, who buys more beer, you know, there may be differences in socioeconomic status between football fans and tennis fans, and that's why you're going to see differences in uh, um, a beer consumption. Well, then what you do is you go to the football group and you find the highest SES person, and you go to the tennis group and you find somebody uh, with the similar SES, and you select them in your study. And you go and you find the next highest in each group, select them in your study. So you're matching people, you get the highest in this other possible thing, and going on down the list, so that everybody has uh, kind of a, a twin on that variable. Right? So that on average, the two groups should no longer differ on SES because they've been matched on that variable. And sometimes people try to match on multiple variables. The problem is, you know, it's not too bad to match on one variable, but usually there's lots of different variables. We say, well, it could be this, could be this, could be this. And it's hard to match on multiple variables. Okay. Uh, unless you have just a huge population and lots of access to, to get lots of people. Um, so metric design might be helpful, but just measuring those other variables is often more, more realistic. Uh, and then a third approach that people use sometimes is to attempt to statistically control for these third variables, using things like regression or ANCOVA. Um, somewhat of a problematic uh, approach uh, conceptually, and uh, regression, uh, this is where uh, you're looking, you know, is the relationship between uh, uh, amount of time spent uh, studying and GPA uh, after accounting for um, intelligence. So you do a regression trying to predict uh, GPA. You would enter intelligence first into the regression equation. It would suck up all the variable it could and then put in uh, um, study time and see how much you could predict GPA. The problem with that is when people say, well, uh, I've if then there is a relationship between study time and GPA, they say, oh yeah, um, regardless of your intelligence, this is how this is how important uh, um, study time is. And that's not exactly true, right? Because all we've done is account for variability, and we've eaten up actually some of the variability that uh, study time would have accounted for if it had any kind of shared variability with intelligence. Um, even more of a problem, I think, with ANCOVA, which you use more in causal comparative, where you're comparing uh, two groups uh, on some uh, uh, dependent variable, and you're going to enter a covariate, <coughs> excuse me, um, which is a way of trying to statistically treat people as if they were the same on some important uh, variable. Um, in it's hard to kind of explain succinctly, mathematically, how this happens, but basically it shrinks people on a, a particular variable down to the same level as if they were all the same. So uh, if you think, well, SES plays a role, uh, so we're going to use it as a covariate because it's not what we're interested in, so we're going to act like everybody had the same SES. Then we'll say, okay, well, if after accounting for SES as a covariate, these two groups still differed on whatever. Right? Well, statistically, you may be able to 
act like those two groups are the same in SES. But if they're not, like if one is substantially more uh, uh, affluent and educated than the other, then no amount of uh, number uh, games is going to make them the same. So you're acting as if they're the same, but that's a bit of a, a mathematical fallacy. Um, so I don't recommend that approach uh, for accounting for third variable problems. Uh, another issue in interpretation of uh, uh, correlations is the potential for false positives. Um, and this is something that you see sometimes with uh, undergrads where they'll, they'll run just a buttload of bivariate correlations. So they'll have you know, 10 variables and they'll say, well, I'm just going to run a correlation between among all 10 of these. You know, is A correlate with B, is A with C, is A with D, is A with E, is A with F, is B with A, is B with C, is B, you know, you get the picture, this huge correlation matrix where they look at every possible thing. And they say, oh yeah, here's, a, here's one, segment, here's one, and here's one. Well, the more analyses you run, the more likely it is you're going to have at least one of those analyses show up as statistically significant when it's not. Right? It's something we call the uh, family-wise error rate. The more analyses you run, whatever type of analysis, the more you run, the more likely you're going to make a type 1 error, where you're going to have one that it says it's there's a statistically significant difference when, in fact, the null hypothesis was true, and there's not a difference. Um, so you want to be cautious about just running correlations uh, aimlessly and really focus on what are your questions and what relationships do you expect to have rather than just, well, hey, let's see. Because if you do that, you're going to open up yourself to finding things that um, might not be repeatable, might be just an artifact of your particular data set. Where, oh, well, I found these correlations. Well, if you, get, if you went and did the same study and got a different people, it wouldn't show up as significant again because it was due to random error. Okay. Uh, another issue is insignificant uh, significance. And this has to do with those uh, small correlations that are still statistically significant. Uh, and the, the, the deal here is, if you have a large enough sample size, you can find uh, statistically significant correlations that are very, very small. You know, theoretically, you can have an, uh, a correlation coefficient of 0 0.001. That was statistically significant. If the correlation was 0 0.001, that means that R squared is 0.0001, right? So you're looking at some infinitesimal amount of variability one variable accounted for by the other. It's like, well, that, uh, that's not meaningful at all. Uh, and so sometimes just because something is statistically significant doesn't mean it's significant in terms of important or clinically significant. It may not give us meaning information to use uh, in terms of helping clients or helping people in the world or making predictions. Sometimes. Depends on what we're talking about. Depends on the stakes, right? Um, when in uh, medical research, oftentimes when they're doing uh, drug studies and they're saying, okay, uh, you know, does using this drug, is there an association between using this drug or doing this thing and some outcome related to dying? Whenever that happens, r even really small correlations, people take, if they're statistically significant, they take, uh, take note of, right? So if um, there's a small correlation between uh, people who um, have this particular kind of diet and uh, develop strokes, then they may make a rec recommendation say, well, don't, don't eat those things because there's a slightly increased risk chance for stroke. Even if it's a super small correlation, it still s if it's statistically significant and it's kind of repeatable, you find it again and again in different groups, well, it's real, it's small, but it's real, is it worth it to you to increase your risk for, for dying, overeating, uh, you know, raw meat or whatever weird thing it is. Okay. So just because something is statistically significant doesn't mean it's clinically significant. But sometimes, on the other hand, sometimes small correlations are significant. Okay. But if it's not statistically significant, then we're probably not going to think it's significant any other way either because we're going to assume that, well, probably due to chance kind of relationship. Sometimes when we don't find uh, relationships, we have non-significant or null findings. Well, sometimes it's because there's not a relationship between variables. Right? But sometimes, in reality, there is, but we fail to find it. Why might we fail to find uh, a relationship? 
a couple things. One of the most uh, common ones, and a problem that's I think being addressed in the research methods literature uh, more in the past five years, is insufficient power, right? Insufficient power to detect a relationship, or in an experiment, say, insufficient power to detect an effect. Uh, and a lot of things influence power. Uh, one of the things that you can control is number of participants. So again, what I said before about if you get enough participants, you can find really small effects. But if you have too few ex participants, you'll miss even large relationships, right? So there may be a pretty strong relationship between two variables, but if, you, if your study has five people in it, you may not find a correlation, right? You didn't have sufficient power, right? Um, so the size of your sample influences power. The, uh, uh, the specificity of your uh, uh, measure will influence power because it influences the variability in your, in your measures. Uh, and then also your choice of alpha, which is uh, a choice you make, influences power. Choosing a smaller alpha, going from 0 uh, 0.05 down to 0 0.01, a more stringent alpha, decreases your power, makes it harder to find an effect. You've, you're moving kind of the goalpost for statistical significance farther away. Right? Where somebody say, oh yeah, because uh, I really want to show it's a strong effect. Well, in the past couple year, years we've realized that your alpha size doesn't tell you anything about the size of relationship, the size of effect. That's what the coefficient of determination is for. That's what uh, effect sizes are for in experimental research. So don't worry too much about alpha. Just typically use the default of 0.05 and, and don't worry too much about it. It's not actually that important. Um, okay, so you want sufficiently powered uh, studies. We just have enough participants. And well, how many is enough? Well, it depends on how many variables you have. The more variables you have, the more people you got to have. Right. I think in uh, a very, very general guideline is um, 15 people uh, per um, uh, variable. And for small amounts of variables, it's more than that. Um, but that's a, a kind of a, a minimum. Um, another potential uh, reason for null findings when they're really relationship between variables is there's a restricted range of scores in one or more of your variables in your pre predictor variable or in your criterion variable in your particular sample. Right, so you didn't have enough uh, variability. Everybody was kind of the same. Because right, correlation is all about predicting variability with variability. And if you don't have any variability, if everybody's the same, you can't find a correlation. If you have this uh, homogeneous group, you're not going to find a correlation. Right? Um, I think there's some things that you just know are correlated, but uh, if you look in the wrong place, you're you're not gonna uh, find it, right? I uh, like to say, well, um, I think uh, you know, I've got uh, some questions I ask about um, uh, how you uh, deal with your uh, emotions in terms of uh, getting upset and being impulsive. And then I'm going to look at uh, does your score on this measure of uh, impulsivity and emotion regulation uh, relate to uh, aggressive behavior? Right? And it should be a good correlation between these two things. But then I go and I, I uh, assess people um, who are in um, a maximum security prison. Or I assess people who are all uh, um, uh, boxers. Right? I may not find uh, a, a significant correlation, right? Because everybody might be the same. I don't have enough variability in the amount of aggression, right? If everybody has the same amount of aggression, I can't get a significant correlation. I have no variability to predict or to predict with. Uh, um, and sometimes that's because of uh, simply a uh, truncated range where everybody is close together. Sometimes it's uh, a ceiling effect where um, Everybody looks the same. They're really different, but you're just not measuring high enough. They're hitting the ceiling. They can't score any more, uh, any higher on your measure because you know it's um, one out of ten. And actually, you know, some are some are 14, some are 16, some are 20. So there's variability there. You just can't see it because your measure didn't go high enough. Or floor effects where your measure didn't go uh, low enough, right? We're using maybe uh, um, you know some. Uh, academic measure with uh, profoundly uh, mentally retarded individuals, you know, they, if everybody gets a zero on the test, 
well, some people, some of those people, may actually have more skills than others in terms of academic stuff, but you're not measuring low enough for them. Right? So you have ceiling effects, floor effects, and then also truncated range, where um, not necessarily is your measure a problem with your measure. It's just everybody is the same on one of your variables. Uh, when that happens, you get uh, anything else that happens, you get restricted range, and you're not going to find a correlation. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, having an insensitive uh, uh, measure. So if you if there are differences between people, but your measure isn't sensitive enough to show those, you're not going to find a correlation. Right. So um, think about some sort of attitude uh, uh, survey, and you say, is, is there a correlation between uh, attitude about um, uh, tuition increases and um, willingness to uh, uh, vote for um, a, a bond package to f to help a school uh, raise money. Right? If you ask about the attitude toward tuition increases, uh, are you um, uh, opposed, in favor, or don't care? You just ask those three points. Well, people, if there's differences between don't care and in favor, slightly in favor, really in favor, if there are important differences there, you're not picking up on them, so you have an instance to measure, and again, you're not going to get very much variability. And you have to have variability to uh, calculate correlations. Kay. And then the, the last potential problem is if you're looking at a non-linear relationship and you're using a traditional linear correlation coefficient, like the Pearson R. And there are correlation coefficients specifically for non-linear relationships. Uh, but sometimes you have, to know, well, you have to know to use that. Uh, um, so you could have a curvilinear relationship, like what we know about the relationship between uh, anxiety and performance, where initially there's a, a positive correlation between anxiety and performance, where uh, very low anxiety is associated with low performance, and as anxiety increases, performance goes up. But then it seems to plateau, and then at some point, increasing anxiety decreases performance. So we go from a positive correlation to a negative correlation. But if we looked at that with a uh, standard uh, Pearson R, we would find probably a correlation of zero. Because the best fit line for that, that's a straight line, is a flat line. And a flat line has no slope. And so it's no relationship. right? Um, so often what you'll, you'll do with correlation research, before you run your uh, analyses, is you plot the data on the x and y axis. And you look at something like a scatter plot. You say, OK, does it look like there's any kind of bending here? Or does it look linear, either going up left to right or going down? left to right. Okay. So plot the data first, uh, give you a hint about if you have potentially a non-linear relationship. Or for you know theoretical reasons, you expect a non-linear relationship, then you would probably use uh, the appropriate correlation coefficient for that as well. Um, another thing in terms of uh, interpretation, uh, the importance of measurement uh, validity. Because uh, again here, you're not manipulating any, any variables. So the 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 truthfulness, the validity of your results and of the conclusions you can draw are largely dependent on how well you're measuring the constructs uh, um, that you're uh, studying. Right? So construct validity becomes really super important um, for, for correlational uh, uh, research. Related to that, uh, there are some uh, things to consider in terms of where the data come from that can uh, influence the validity of the data and the validity of conclusions you could draw. Um, so sometimes you get correlational data from uh, uh, correlational studies from archival data, right? which is where you have uh, data that were already collected, often for some other purpose than your research. Right? Um, so you know, students' SAT scores, college GPAs, those data are there. They're existing in some system, uh, but they weren't collected for research. They were collected for some other purpose. Uh, and if those data are uncoded, uh, so if it's, you know, um, uh, people's uh, comments about uh, news stories, right? The thing you go online, read a news story below, you see all the the comments, which us are usually uh, uh, racial or homophobic or both, and and negative. Uh, interesting slices of psychology there. But you have uh, people saying stuff, and when they say stuff. That's behavior, and it's data. But it's not a number, it's just a bunch of words. It's uncoded data. And so often when you have archival, archival data, it comes in this kind of uncoded format where it's in, in prose of some uh, 
form. And if you want to run quantitative analysis on it, you've got to convert it to numbers, right? So the most common way of doing that is uh, using something called content analysis. Right? And this is uh, really kind of a, a ground-up approach where you're um, reading the stuff and saying, okay, what are the themes reflected here? And then uh, coming down to, okay, here's a theme. I could, I could subdivide that theme into these things. And then you end up coming up with, okay, if they say uh, something similar to this prototypical uh, uh, response, this is, uh, you know, uh, anger. This is... Um, uh, humor. This is um, sarcasm. Whatever it is you're trying to, to look at, but uh, and you code those things. Um, you know, one, two, three, four, uh, whatever. And then you can do something with the data. Now, the problem with with content analysis is it is a transformation of data from one form to another that is potentially fairly subjective, right? You're deciding what this thing means, what category some uh, uh, behavior falls in. So you try to make it uh, less subjective, usually by involving more than one person in doing the content analysis. So you often, uh, one person or a small group of people will come up with the categories, and then they'll get more people to say, okay, here's the stuff, let's see what categories you put it into. And then you can look at the rate of agreement. Okay, if we put stuff in the same category, we've got high inter rater reliability. If we've got a lot of mismatch, then um, either we have poorly defined uh, categories, right? Or we have uh, poor training in terms of telling people what the categories mean, or what we're looking at is really too just too nebulous to be put into categories. And we've got a problem, and we we can't do good research on uh, we can't do good quantitative research on that. And we're probably gonna have to go on something more more qualitative. Um, so uh, content analysis is used with archival data. Uh, Another potential problem with archival data is instrumentation, instrumentation bias, which can actually happen with other types of research too, but especially with archival data. And this is all about when how the data uh, are recorded or measured at one point in time. And this is when you're looking from you know, time one to time two. Uh, how they're recorded, who records them, is different than how it's done at time two. Right. Um, so you know if you're looking at um, you know, you want to know if introducing a seatbelt law um, uh, changed the number of uh, fatal accidents in some county. Right? Well, you go back and you look at archival data regarding number of accidents before and after this legislation is passed, but you got to make sure that, okay, well, are accidents always reported the same way? Because what if, well, before that law went in place, it was uh, the police officers were, were reporting accidents, and then afterwards, uh, you know, for some policy change, they were no longer recording the information, putting it in this database. It was insurance companies who were uh, collecting this data. Now, you've got different people collecting the data. So, if we have a, a time one, time two difference, is it because of the CBOT law or is it because of who's collecting the data or how the questions are being asked? When that happens, you have instrumentation bias. Uh, another source of data would be uh, observation, you know, which we could do, you know, obviously in a laboratory, we get the most control. Uh, naturalistic, where you go to where people are doing something and watch them. Or participant observation, where you pretend to be part of the group, which is kind of what uh, anthropologists often use. Uh, you know, so if you want to find out what's going on at AA meetings, going and pretending to uh, have an alcohol uh, dependence disorder, or uh, at least problem. Um, Problems with with uh, potential problems in terms of uh, correlation research um, from those sources of data. Um, if people know you're watching them, they may act differently, which we call uh, reactance. Right? Uh, so they react to you being there. Um, so what you're seeing may not be true behavior; it's behavior influenced by your observation. And then there's also always the the um, potential problem of biased interpretation. Right? Instead of getting people you know, people self-report, we have their bias to worry about, and whenever we're observing them, we have our own biases to worry about influencing uh, what data come out of that. Um, and again, bias isn't not necessarily in this kind of pejorative terms of, oh, I'm trying to make these people look bad, but bias in terms of different people will see different things, right? Two people go to the classroom to observe a child uh, and have them come out of that classroom and write down a narrative of what that child was like and what they did, you may get very different stories depending on 
what they expected to see, their own experiences, all these different things, they will see the child do different things. I oh, saw the child constantly out of uh, uh, her seat. Uh, saw the child um, frequently um, going to other children to help them with their work. Right? So maybe it was the same behavior, but reported differently, and that's potentially biased interpretation. Which you can cut down on that if you do more structured observation, where if you're going to have people go observe participants, you tell them exactly what to look for and um, what it uh, what it looks like. So um, you're going to look for um, anger, and anger as defined by bop, 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 right? So you have clear operational definitions um, for your uh, collecting observational data. Uh, and the tests, uh, existing sets of questions that have previously been administered to enough people that there are data regarding what answers uh, to the test questions mean. Uh, so these are your established psych psychological tests usually. Uh, you want to look at the psychometric properties of these things, you know, um, uh, reliability coefficients, sometimes uh, validity coefficients are provided, uh, frequently internal consistency, you know, Cronbach's alpha, that kind of thing. Um, but again, even if a test has good psychometric properties, doesn't mean it's a valid test. No test in and of itself is valid. It all depends on w for what purpose and with whom. So one thing to look at when you're looking at the psychometric properties of a test, what kind of population were those psychometric properties established on? Right? So if a test has shown good reliability and validity um, when used with um, you know, high school students in um, uh, North America, and you want to go same, use the same test of anxiety on, on your research site that you're going to do down in uh, Mexico, well, th this test has good reliability and validity. Well, m maybe it does with this other population, maybe it doesn't. You don't know. Okay. Uh, so look at the second psych psych properties, look at how and with whom they were established. Uh, the last one, source of data being surveys. You know, sets of questions typically that you create when there's not some test that uh, somebody else has already done and collected it on. You ask your own. And here, the quality of the data and what they mean is substantially influenced by the quality of the questions. And it, it's uh, often difficult to create a good survey to get uh, good data. And it's easy to write biased questions. It's easy to get people to slant uh, to slant the data one way or the other asking the questions a certain way or presenting questions in certain orders. So um, you have to be very careful about uh, survey design. Um, and when looking at uh, other research and saying, well, they found this correlation, what does it mean? Or they used a survey. Look carefully at what questions they asked and how they asked those questions. Okay. So uh, relationships among multiple variables. We've already talked about multiple regression. Uh, multivariate regression is another way of, of, of saying it, um, where we're looking at uh, uh, multiple predictors in one criterion. Uh, but that's all. It's still just that one criterion on on the kind of the right side of the equation, as I think of it. If you want to look at multiple predictors and multiple criterion variables, so multiple variables on both sides of the equation, you look at something called canonical correlation, which you can do, and this is where um, how do variables uh, combine to predict each other, which is fairly complicated. Uh, you also have multivariate uh, ANOVA, in which uh, a typical ANOVA, it's like, okay, do these groups differ on this one dependent variable? Multivariate ANOVA says, do these groups differ on some combination of dependent variables? Uh, which can sometimes be, be helpful. Um, looking at moderating uh, relationships, moderation. Um, we talk about here because you often use regression to figure this out. This is all about when a relationship between two variables depends on some the, the status of some other variable. So it could be that the relationship between A and C uh, is positive when B is high, but the relationship between A and C is negative when B is low. Or there's uh, the relationship between A and C is positive when B is high, but when B is low, there's no relationship between A and C. Right? So, C, uh, sorry, the, the middle variable moderates the relationship between the other two, okay. uh, and you can figure that out with uh, regression, where if you have kind of this A B C, where 
relation with A and C, you think B is a, a moderator. Uh, you put uh, you know C in as your criterion. You put A and B both in as uh, predictors. But then you also put in uh, the interaction term, which is A times B, as a predictor itself. And if the interaction term emerges as uh, a significant predictor of the criterion, that suggests the presence of moderation. Then you, you you go back and you do more analyses where you you split uh, the two groups on the moderator. So you look at people who are high in B, and you select them out, and you do a correlation between A and C. And you select people out who are low in B, and you do a correlation between A and C, and you see if the relationship is different at different levels of uh, of B. And high and low. Often you do that with just a median split above the median, below the median, uh, unless you have some reason to split it otherwise sometimes into, into uh, thirds or into uh, quartiles, but most, most commonly in uh, median split. Uh, and the other thing, looking at multiple variables, is the potential for mediation. And this is when A influences B, which then influences C. So you see this kind of correlation between A and C, but it's because A causes B, which causes C. Or at least theoretically causes, because again, we can't establish causation from correlation. Um, And, and that is a little trickier to establish statistically and using some more complicated things like uh, path analysis. Although you can get an idea of it just by showing that there's a correlation between A and B, between B and C, and A and C. But just because there are all these correlation variables that are correlated doesn't mean there's mediation. You actually have to do some, some uh, higher level stat stuff to, to figure that out, which um, most of you, I think, will probably have to, to worry about that. Um, okay, summing up. Um, Predictive variables, criterion variables, the terms we use when talking about correlational studies, not uh, independent variable uh, and dependent variable. The number of predictors and number of criterion determine number of predictive variables, number of criterion variables determines what analysis you use. Right? And again, traditional a continuous predictor, continuous criterion. It's a simple Pearson R correlation coefficient. You're doing a bivariate correlation. If we've got a categorical predictor and a dependent criterion, we're probably doing causal comparative research, or we're probably going to be doing something like a t-test or an ANOVA. Right? If we've got two categorical things, a categorical predictor and a categorical criterion, we're probably looking at uh, a chi-square. You cannot directly infer causation from correlation. Right? And you get that drilled in your heads, hopefully from the time you first take stats in undergrad. However, you can build the evidence for causation. Right, so if you establish correlation in your study, there are things you can do in that same study to say, okay, uh, I know I can't say this causes this, but it might be because of this, this, and this, but there are things you can do to account for that. Well, it might you say it might be this, but I measured that, and it's not related. Or it might be this, but my groups are the same on that, so it, it, it can't be that difference that's causing this difference in dependent variable. Um, and if you are trying to establish causation, but again, not able to move any variable, you've got to do that extra work to build your evidence for causation. Okay, that's all for now.